we will practitioners from Boston, Massachusetts and Rebaldendo headquarters. This is Ali Nese, and today I have the pleasure of being joined from Valencia, Spain by Dr. Adrian Lozano, Program Director at the Postdoctoral Nodonic Program at the University of Valencia and author of multiple research articles and periodicals and in private practice in Valencia, Spain. Dr. Lozano, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Ali, for inviting me. Dr. Lozano, you've done a great case that I saw and I wanted to share with our audience. And uh, this is a case of a cervical root resorption that you uh, masterfully treated and repaired. And uh, uh, I think it really has a significant uh, learning objective for people. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to quickly share this case with everyone. And then I will ask you a few questions. So this seems to be a case of a 25-year-old female patient that was under orthodontic therapy for about three years. Okay. And this patient has some periodontal abscess uh, about 20 days prior to the time you saw this patient. And it was a vital pulp that was negative to percussion and palpation. And it had some probing on the, uh, on the lingual aspect of the tooth. And as you can see here, the probing uh, is, uh, is fairly deep on the lingual side. And there is also a lot of uh, um, hygiene issues here. Dr. Lozano, do you often see hygiene problems associated with orthodontic cases? And do you think in this case, the orthodontic forces or um, you know, history of trauma had anything to do with the resorption? Yeah, I, I think the, the orthodontic treatment was the, pre the predisposing factor to, to this resorption, absolutely. Uh, you, you know that resorption is only uh, inflammative, but in, in the, then there's a superimposed uh, uh, secondary infection from the sulcus, the jiva sulcus, because you, have, you say there is loss of uh, hygiene. So, yeah. so this, this is the contamination, so it became uh, infectious also. Yeah, so the abscess was actually periodontal in origin because the pulp was vital and yet this patient had a periodontal abscess. So a combination of poor oral hygiene and this resorptive defect was a perfect storm for creating this periodontal abscess. However, the periodontal abscess would recur unless the source is at rest. So in the radiograph, you can see a very large uh, radiolucency in the middle portion of this root that does tend to become diffuse as we go closer to the apical area. So now this shows this is basically an external root resorption. And how you determine this, uh, Dr. Lozano, was by taking a CBCT, which is the first thing that people uh, that see this kind of a pattern should do, correct? Do you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, correct. And the American Association of Endodontists and the European Society of Endodontology uh, say also that, that it's, it's required to, to, to take a CBCT in these cases. Yeah, that, that opinion paper just came out very recently, and you're absolutely right. In cases like this, where you have to really yeah. understand the three-dimensional nature of the disease, you do need to have a CBCT that does show you not just in a buccolingual direction, as you take with a periapical x-ray and a mesodistal uh, expanse, but rather from the top to the bottom uh, in an axial direction, also what you're dealing with. And here, uh, as you can see on the uh, axial section, you have a fairly large lesion coronally uh, that goes actually below the uh, attachment, and that's a significant problem for this patient. Now, uh, you decided to treat this treatment planet uh, by trying to save the patient, uh, save the to uh, tooth for the patient. Now, we always talk about the treatment planning in cases like this, that it doesn't happen in a vacuum. Clearly, patient communication is a really significant and important part because you can't promise these patients the world, correct? Correct. Yeah. So, uh, how, do you, how do you put it to this patient, for example? Say that, you know, this... This is obviously a young patient um, uh, who's just going through orthodontic therapy for basically improving their bite. So surely you don't want to yeah. tell them that they're going to suddenly lose their canine. That's not very good news, obviously. So how do you manage the patient's expectations in terms of your success for attempting to save this tooth through obviously first non-surgical root canal therapy and then external repair? Yeah, I... I I always say the, the truth. I mean, uh, I say uh, this is a big lesion that I don't know if, uh, if it could be the, the, the final treatment because these lesions, the disruptions uh, could uh, recede by. I mean, it could be present in the future again. So I say, yeah, we, we can try. If you want, we can try. I, I, in most of the cases, if we clean the, all the resorption, it will be okay. 
at least for a, a, a few years or, or a lot of years, but I don't know. But I, I can I prefer to to save teeth and to to because it's young lady, so I prefer to 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 save the teeth. From the CBCT, you can see that the lesion seems to be uh, more of a limited and focal kind of kind. It's not just resorbing half the root away in a very diffuse way. So it's possible for you to access it. I think one of the main, main um, um, predictors of success in these cases, I think, is having surgical access to the site. And if the, the, yeah. if the area just diffuses all over the root in the apical area, that's very difficult to get to. But this seems to be, uh, at least based on the resolution of the CBCT, more on the lingual side and almost, you know, limited to a box type of a lesion. So what you did yeah. here, which is the logical thing to do with a lesion of this size, and this, by the way, what Heather say uh, um, classification of a lesion would this be? And it is be a class three of Heather say it's because the it's the third class. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a it's a lesion that is in the in the cervical portion mm -hmm. that goes a little bit apically, and the and the palpable space is maintained. So and it's vital too. So mm -hmm. it's class three, and we can manage it perfectly with a surgical approach. Yeah, in this case, I think the non-surgical treatment, yeah. despite the fact that the tooth is vital, would be necessary because of the the overall extent of the lesion. And I think you have the right judgment here of doing the non-surgical uh, root canal therapy, conventional therapy first, prior to doing the root, uh, the surgical management so that the patient does not end up having a significant uh, uh, problem right after the um, surgical repair. And I can see here on the x-ray that you treated this tooth non-surgically uh, with up to a size uh, 70 uh, apical diameter and you enlarged it very uh, well. And uh, from my conversation with you beforehand, you used a copious amount of uh, sodium hypochlorite for irrigation and fitted size uh, 70 gutta percha cones. And uh, I can see that you use hydraulic condensation then to, to fill this uh, tooth using the biceramic uh, sealer and cement first as your first step. So Dr. Lozano, I can see that after doing the root canal therapy, you reflected a flap, and I can see on the uh, uh, pictures that you've taken that the, uh, the lesion is fairly obvious once you reflect a flap, uh, and what's interesting is you can actually see the biceramic sealer internally at the, uh, you know, at the depth of the, um, uh, the resorptive defect, which actually shows that there really was a communication uh, somehow uh, that you can see um, the biceramic sealer there. So at this point, uh, what did you do after you uh, exposed the, the site and you could see the resorptive uh, tissue and uh, the, the defect on the lingual aspect of this tooth? What was the first thing that you did? Okay, after I removed all the resorptive tissue, I, I, I saw it. I, I used the trichloroacetic uh, acid that is uh, a calorant that it produces a necrosis, a, co a co coagulation necrosis, and eliminates all the uh, resorptive cells. So I can eliminate it perfectly and leave it uh, almost clean. I mean, perfectly clean. So then I can use my my uh, material to that I used. Uh, it was uh, the DC party bioceramic material. So basically, what you did then is that once you curetted out the uh, the actual resorptive uh, material using a, probably a curette or maybe a, even a, uh, a round burr, uh, then you applied TCA or trichloric uh, chloracetic acid to necrotize and coagulate the remaining tissue so that it would then basically fall off so it wouldn't remain active. And then cleaned off the lesion, got a nice clean lesion, and then filled it with the uh, BC putty, uh, which uh, using a spatula. And almost I can see here that you've done a little bit of plaster work. You're pretty good at it too. Uh, and you've done a very nice job of adapting it completely to the root surface. And, uh, and then cleaning it up. I found that a micro brush at this point is also helpful to remove any of the remaining flash on the walls. But I've come to realize that you don't have to be so zealous to remove everything because the material is just basically so biocompatible. If it's very thin, it, it will get resorbed out, but um, the bulk portion will then uh, stay in place. So I can see then that you uh, um, did almost like a, a coronally positioned flap uh, and you took a little bit of a, um, uh, of a, of a material 
uh, out and sent it for a biopsy and uh, you have a fiber epithelial hyperplasia with a chronic inflammation as your uh, biopsy result, which is kind of uh, what we would expect. So I just wanted to also share this little video that you uh, took of this uh, procedure here with our viewers. So what I see is that you reflected the flap here already and are using a uh, Gracie curette and you're now removing the lesion. The Filizano, it's very important to try to remove as much as the lesion as you can see. Do you agree with that? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and I can see here that you're also even using some ultrasonics here to help you in terms of loosening up the debris and uh, removing it. Some of the ball head um, ultrasonic tips with a diamond coating, I think, can be pretty helpful on that front. And I can see that you're also using a diamond uh, round burr on a uh, high-speed handpiece, and you're further kind of removing and cleaning the, uh, uh, the lesion. And that looks like it's been cleaned out pretty well. And I can see that you're also exploring around the tooth to see if there is any additional uh, spaces that you can see. But at this point now you're applying the TCA to create the coagulation. And after letting it dry and cleaning the rest of it out, I can see that you are applying the uh, biceramic putty to the area. and you're adding that incrementally so you can avoid trapping any voids and then patting it down. It's really important to understand what you're doing is the exact correct way of doing this. This, this material does not require a lot of heavy condensation. It's more about patting it down into place because the material is hydrophilic and will adapt to the walls and you're using at the end a, uh, uh, a ball burnisher here to just kind of close down the margins uh, very gently. And I think that's uh, all for the video here. And uh, I can see that now on the post, uh, immediate post-op, you have a very nice and dense fill in the area of the resorption. And it seems like you've tried to put as much of a possible of a coronally positioned flap so you can cover as much of the material as possible. So how did the patient fare immediately post-operatively? Well, it was perfect. I mean, it was uh, uh, no pain, no, uh, no uh, bleeding, no, no, no swelling, no symptom. Terrific. No swelling, or, in, a, in a week, uh, I, I saw her in a week to take the shorter out, it was well, the two point, the two shorter. Uh, and uh, in, the, in that week, and I, I did the, the uh, aesthetic restoration of the, of the palatal portion with uh, some bonding resin composite. Uh, was it a pure, so now let's just kind of clarify this for uh, our viewers here. So the first step was to use the biocompatible putty so that you can actually have a base layer underneath there. Because this lesion was transgingival, so that portion of it was subgingival, where you have to have the most biocompatibility, and then portion of it was supergingival, where you have to have the most, the smoothest surface and the least wear resistant surface possible. Um, you kind of had to do a sandwich technique here, but you, you did it in two steps, which is the correct way. So you basically place the putty at the base, which is the most biocompatible material, and you let that set for a little while until you had some initial healing and the material set. When the patient came back, that portion of the putty material that was super gingival, it had the risk in the long run of being a wearing down as well as you know not being as smooth of a surface as the enamel of the tooth itself. So you basically created a class five restoration. And did you use a hybrid glass ionomer composite restoration, something like Geristor, or did you just use a pure composite? In this, in this uh, case, I use a pure composite. A pure composite. Other cases, of other, I use the very uh, store or something like that. I mean, a uh, glagionomer, reinforced glagionomer. Mm -hmm. But here is a pure composite because it was not bleeding in a week. And we can manage perfectly the, uh, the, yeah. 
you can pass it. It's, that's very, I mean, you did a great job. It looks beautiful. Um, I think the key for uh, our viewers to understand here is that it needs to, um, if they're going to isolate the area, which you normally have to with a rubber dam, it would be best to place the clamp on the tooth behind it so they don't end up putting a clamp directly right on the, uh, um, on the putty material that is set because it'll, again, it'll create a defect and anytime you don't have a smooth surface, that's not a very good thing. So you, I can see also on a one month recall, you have beautiful healing and uh, I can see there's a little bit of staining, which is probably from the chlorhexidine, right, that the patient was taking? Yeah, it was about the 2% chlorhexidine, yeah. Terrific. And I can see here now on the four-month recall, you have excellent healing. I mean, the, the, the gingiva looks completely uh, uh, healthy, and I can see that the uh, orthodontist is also placed in a retainer in this tooth um, for the anterior sextants seems to me that by putting this kind of using the sandwich technique which allows both for a biocompatible um, component of the material uh, which should be against the tissues the gingival portion to be made of a biceramic putty and then using the set material at a later time to place a composite restoration that could be polished allows a kind of an idealized situation in which you could get the best of both worlds. You take the advantage of the uh, biocompatibility of the biceramics and then the polishability of the composites so that later on in time when the patient keeps brushing that area, which we all hope they will, correct? <laughs> so that that would not create too much of an <laughs> abrasion on the bioceramic putty material. So Dr. Lozano, obviously the success of any restoration has a lot to do with patient's maintenance and home care and hygiene. And clearly this patient, especially now that they have a retainer, uh, it's very important for them to uh, make sure that, you know, to communicate with the patient that they keep the area clean. Also, at the same time, for hygiene visits, do you have any specific recommendations in terms of probing the area by the hygienist who will go and do a cleaning or by the dentist? Uh, is there any preference that you have normally in these kinds of repair cases? No, uh, the most important thing is that this patient has to be very serious with his uh, with her uh, hygiene, and she, she has to go to the general practitioner for the uh, parentist to 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 maintain this uh, this perfectly clean. And we can manage, uh, we can test, uh, probing the, this uh, gingiva uh, in, in order to know if, if there is a reattachment or no reattachment in this part of the, of the tooth. That's terrific. Well, I do also hope that we can follow up with this patient and uh, meet up with you again in a few years as a follow up and see how this uh, case fared. It would be very important. Sure, it would be great. From Valencia, Spain, uh, I was joined by Dr. Adrian Lozano, Program Director at the University of Valencia Postdoctoral Endodontic Program, and in private practice in Valencia, Spain. Dr. Lozano, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for inviting me, Ali. It was a pleasure. For Revolvendo, I'm Ali Nese, and I hope you found this information helpful.